Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction and also I do feel very honoured uh, to be giving this annual lecture for the British Society for the History of Mathematics. Uh, so I'm going to be talking primarily uh, about the end of the 18th century this evening, but I'm going to start in what might seem rather an odd place uh, several years later in 1860 with a notorious debate at Oxford uh, between Bishop Samuel Wilberforce um, that he was nicknamed Soapy Sam. He was that eloquent reactionary campaigner who objected to Dar uh, Darwin's theory of evolution and Thomas Huxley who was known as Charles Darwin's bulldog because while Darwin liked to stay at home in the safety and security of his house at Down in Kent uh, Huxley went out and championed his new theory of evolution. So allegedly, after failing to defeat his opponent on scientific grounds, Wilberforce famously resorted to inquiring, was it from his grandfather or his grandmother that Huxley was descended from a monkey? And this has become a very notorious jibe, but the follow-up isn't quite such a well-known story that 13 years later Huxley did get his final revenge. Wilberforce fell off his horse and died, and Huxley quipped that Wilberforce's brains had at last met reality with fatal results. Right, what you would see now is a picture of Wilberforce and also a a fascinating caricature, it's one of my favourite, of Charles Darwin. And the reason that I was going to sh will show you in a minute, this particular one, is because it's the result of a competition, an image competition that was run by the British Society for the History of Science uh, in 2009. Which and the picture on the right um, is Charles Darwin. And it was, the as I said, it was the prize-winning picture in a competition. And the reason I'm showing it to you is that I thought perhaps the British Society for the History of Mathematics might like to promote itself by advertising a similar competition. That was the point of our competition. I do, I do think it's a marvellous picture of Darwin. So the same year as the debate in 1860 at Oxford, Wilberforce published anonymously a very vitriolic review of Darwin's book on the origin of species. It's also a very, very long review. Wilberforce was the sort of person, like many other Victorians, that never say anything in one word when you can provide ten instead. And this, talk, this paper goes on for a long while, but right at the end, there's a much longer version of the jibe at Huxley about Huxley's grandparents. And this time, it was directed at Erasmus Darwin, who was Charles Darwin's grandfather. And Wilberforce joked that Charles had inherited ridiculous opinions from, quote, his ingenious grandsire. And to back this up, Wilberforce reproduced a long extract from a poem. And the poem is called The Loves of the Triangles. And that's going to be the main subject of my talk this evening. It was a three-part poem that parodied the ideas of Erasmus Darwin. And Wilberforce claimed in this review in 1860 that it would be very familiar to many of his readers. And I asked several people at Cambridge who are Victorian specialists and none of them had heard of it. But I did check up on him. I went into several online sources and I very quickly found that this poem, The Loves of the Triangles, was repeatedly referred to throughout the 19th century and even into the 20th century when G.K. Chesterton wrote about it. So it was, it was a poem with a very, very long life. And the title refers directly to a poem by Erasmus Darwin, which is called The Loves of the Plants. And The Loves of the Plants is rather confusingly, it came out as the first part of a two-part poem called The Botanic Garden. And the first, but he then switched the order around. So the first part is called The Economy of Vegetation, and the second part is called The Loves of the Plants. And you can see on the right the frontispiece of The Loves of the Plants, uh, which is Flora at Play with Cupid, uh, from which you can infer probably quite correctly that this is a semi-erotic poem about women and plants. And this is an extract. I'm not asking you to like this poetry. I'm just asking you to appreciate that at the end of the 18th century it was very popular and it sold an awful lot and came out in a lot of editions. Medea's soft chains five suppliant bow confess and hand in hand the laughing bell address. Alike to all she bows with wanton air, rolls her dark eye and waves her golden hair. And there's, it goes on in a similar vein for many, many pages, for four cantos. Now, the loves of the triangles, 
was shorter, but it was written by three young men who just left university and they clearly really enjoyed themselves satirizing Darwin. And I'm going to show you a couple of their verses. Um, first the fair Barabola behold, her timid arms with virgin blush unfold, though on one focus fixed her eyes betray, a heart that glows with love's resistless sway. So it's a sort of mathematical pornography. And I'll show you if you can imagine such a contradiction in terms. And uh, this is just another quite typical verse. I just wanted to give you a flavour of what the poem's like. For me, ye sissoids, round my temples bend your wandering curves, ye conchoids extend. Let playful pendules quick vibration feel, while silent cyclist rests upon her wheel. And this came out in a journal, but it was, later, it was reproduced many times in books at the end of the 18th century. And I don't expect you to be able to um, read this because uh, it's too small. But what you can see, I think, is that there's the verses at the top, but at the bottoms of the pages, especially on the right-hand page of the Loves of the Triangles, there were very, very long footnotes. And that, those footnotes were in themselves a parody of Erasmus Darwin's poem because Erasmus Darwin's poems also had very, very long scholarly footnotes. And the three young writers who wrote this parody really went to town in the footnotes, although it's rather difficult for us to interpret now. So I'm going to show you those two consecutive lines, how loves and graces in an angle dwell, how slow progressive points protract the line. And you can see the asterisks at the end of the line, and that was how people did footnotes in those days. They didn't have little ones and twos and threes like we did. They had symbols like asterisks. The second footnote I managed to work out fairly quickly. The last line has got a pun about the pebbly channel, and I knew that um, because I'm so ancient that I did Latin at school, so I knew that pebble was the Latin for calculus. I'm sorry, calculus was the Latin for a pebble. The first, um, the first footnote I found rather more difficult, but I discovered, thanks to Google, that it's um, a line from Horace, which means the sweet laughter of a girl hiding in a secret corner. For these 18th century writers, there would be no point in having footnotes which were so incredibly complicated to work out. 18th century readers would have immediately understood these jokes. And that was, it was something that was very witty, that was funny, that came out on a, on a weekly basis. So it was something that these young people tossed off, I imagine, when, when they'd had a couple of drinks, and that all their readers would have laughed at. Although they're very difficult for us to decipher now, or certainly for me. And one challenge for me has been to try to work out what some of the footnotes mean, and there's many of them which I've completely given up on. But I think there's a far more interesting question to ask about this poem, and that is why did these three young men go to so much bother to parody Erasmus Darwin and a poem about plants? And that's a question I believe that nobody's really asked. Why did they do it? So I'll tell you a little bit about the journal first. It was a very pro-Pitt journal, and I thought there's loads of pictures of Pitt, but I thought seeing this was a mathematical lecture, I ought to show you a sort of mathematical uh, picture of a sphere projecting against a plane. And the lady, the sphere, is Mrs. Hobart, who was known as a lady of fashion. But more seriously than this, uh, one of Pitt's major political platforms was to protect the British establishment against the French Revolution. In the same year, 1792, that was by Gilray, but there was another uh, cartoon by Rowlandson called The Contrast, in which you can see on the left he's got the ideals of British traditional liberty and he's making an exaggerated contrast with French radical liberty and the enormous misery that people supposedly um, live in uh, are living in under the French Revolution. At first in 1789, uh, many British people had supported the French Revolution. Uh, they recognised its ideals and uh, endorsed it. But the, uh, particularly after the terror started, about in, from about 1792 onwards, there was an enormous backlash against the French Revolution. And people, um, especially con wealthy conservative people with a lot to lose, were very concerned that all this revolutionary activity was going to come over the channel. And so anybody with even vaguely radical ideas was slated as a Jacobin. A Jac to be a Jacobin became a term of abuse. Um, and so this 
gave its name to the Anti-Jacobin, the paper in which the Loves of the Triangles appeared. And it was a political journal that was very pro-Pitt and very anti-French. So I'll show you another verse from the Loves of the Triangles where the satirists have given up the mathematical pornography. They got rather bored with that after the first instalment. And here they're inciting panic about Napoleon's preparations for war against Britain. And they imagine him preparing a fleet to invade the island. Nor long the time ere Britain's shore shall greet the warrior sage with gratulations sweet, eager to grasp the wreath of naval fame, the great republic plans the, fatal, the floating frame. So my challenge is to understand why Erasmus Darwin who's a Midlands doctor, passion for botany, poetry, invention, why should he have been the target for this very conservative, francophobic publication? And so this is, this is my basic question, and I'm still exploring it, and I'm currently writing a book about it. And in this lecture, I'm going to tell you some of the answers that i come up with so far. Seeing triangles have got three sides, three angles, I thought I ought to divide the talk into three parts, quantification, progress, and slavery. And there were also the anti-Jacobin satirists, worth, there were three of them, it, and it, the poem appeared in three instalments. So I'll show you a verse from Darwin about the number three. On the left, the freckled iris owns a fiercer flame and three unjealous husbands wed the dame. And on the right, I've got the direct satire by the anti-Jacobin and you can see very clearly uh, the political ideals, the sort of reflection on the French Revolution. Three gentle swains evolve their longing arms and woo the rep young republics, the French republics, virgin charms. So that even when this was a mathematical satire, satire, it was at the same time very much a political satire and that's, uh, that relationship is what I want to explore. And as well as having triangles in its title, the anti-Jacobin poem plays on, very, uh, on other very famous threesomes, uh, such as the three witches in Macbeth and Lear's three daughters. In fact, they go and sort of riff on the number three. So the first section of my talk is about quantification. And triangles were, of course, emblems of enlightenment during both the French and the American revolutions. There was this new trinity, and almost a holy trinity of liberty, equality, and reason. But in addition to that, the satirist's choice of mathematical imagery for their poem is, I believe, itself a mathematical statement. <coughs> So at a very general level throughout the 17th and 18th century, there was a traditional strong contrast between the French ra rationalism, which in a way is emblematized through this garden at Versailles with its very geometrical layout. And there was a very strong contrast between gardens like this and English garden, country gardens by men such as Capability Brown, which allegedly were completely natural, only of course they were very carefully and artificially contrived to look natural. And this mathematical approach towards the end of the 18th century in England came to symbolize the power of the state and this new rational procedures that were displacing traditional British liberties. So, for example, there was great hostility in Britain towards excise men who were using very accurate instruments to tax beer according to its alcohol content. And measurement was seen in principle as a threat to local autonomy and its replacement by centralized power. Triangles themselves had a more specific significance. So tri triangulation, as many of you probably know, is a surveying technique in which you lay out imaginary triangles on the ground in which each apex is visible from a fourth external high point. And what you do is, you, or what surveyors did, was you measure the baseline and the three angles and that enables you to work out the lengths of the other two sides. And as you can see from this diagram, you can have a chain of triangles sort of snaking across the countryside. And the year that this parody appeared, two French astronomers were just completing a triangulation project to determine the metre, the length of the metre, by measuring a line of longitude. Of course, 
measuring the meter is ideologically, it's a very rational measurement because you're, instead of taking an arbitrary unit of length, you're defining the meter by the dimensions of the Earth itself. So it's a, it's a rational form of measurement. But in Britain, at least, it was seen very much as a French nationalist project, partly because the method of triangulation had been adopted against the British preference, which was a method based on pendulums, and also the French had rather conveniently decided that it was only one line of longitude that would be suitable for making these measurements, and this was a line of longitude through France. And I, I always think it's rather interesting that one of the astronomers made a mistake while he was doing all this triangulation. He was so embarrassed that he never told anybody. So the meter that ended up being on display in Paris was actually slightly the wrong length. So this is a French revolutionary poster advertising the new, the new metric measurements. So at the top, the picture at the top, shows you um, how litres, grams and metres are replacing pints, pounds and owns, which were one of the French measurements. And the bottom, there's ways of measuring wood and money. So obviously, from, I think from a modern point of view, the metric system does seem greatly preferable to all those um, yards, uh, yards, feet and inches and all those interminable sums that I had to do in primary schools with this primary school with 12s and 20s and 36s and 8s and everything else. Um, but it was also a way, it was perceived at the time as a way of controlling from the centre because all the different regions of France had their own individual measurements. So obviously it is more rational to impose one single metric measure, uh, system over the entire country, but it's a way of suppressing local identity and because the, all the provinces were forced to follow the Parisian regime. And from a British perspective, it implied imposing artificial order on a centuries-old system that was based on tradition and also on human dimensions, such as feet and inches. And the revolutionaries also introduced decimal time. So at the bottom, you can see a familiar clock uh, with 12, 12 hours. And at the top, there's a revolutionary clock uh, with 10 hours. And you can see in particular the, the revolutionary figures. And I want you to note particularly the red caps that they're wearing, the bonnet rouge of the revolutionaries, which were known as Phrygian caps. And they, in Britain, they became a symbol of liberty and revolution. Uh, they were a symbol of liberty and revolution in Paris, but in Britain they became a symbol of Jacobin insurrection. And I think the Parisians hated the 10-hour uh, day because that came with a 10-day week, which meant that the working week was considerably extended. And from a British point of view, it was very sacrilegious because it was replacing the seven-day week, uh, which was laid down in the Bible. So there was a lot of opposition to the French Revolution and to the new measuring systems like this. And in Britain, one of the most vocal, prominent um, art, uh, people articulating this resentment against the French Revolution was Edmund Burke, the Irish politician. And he wrote a best-selling book called Reflections on the Revolution in France, which came out in 1790. And he commented that the variations between different parts of France render menstruation a ridiculous standard of power and equality in geometry, the most unequal of all measures in the distribution of men. So what he meant by this was saying partly what I mentioned earlier, that people in different parts of the country had been using different measuring systems so that imposing the centralised system of the, media, of the meter was stamping out local identities. And there were also debates at the time about reforming the electoral system by making constituencies of equal population. But Burke wasn't the only person who objected to the French Revolution. Uh, you don't normally think of encyclopedias as being sort of hotbeds of political activity. But this is the frontispiece of the third edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And you can see it's advertising the classical traditional ideals of classical Rome and Greece. And they brought out a two-volume supplement in 1801. And the main purpose of this supplement was to design to counteract the influence of the French Encyclopédie. So according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the French Encyclopédie was a pestiferous work that disseminated anarchy and atheism. And there were very contrasting views towards mathematics in France and in England at the end of the 18th century. In France, uh, mathematicians and physicists were 
uh, very interested in using calculus and that was totally looked down on in England and didn't appear in England until uh, well into the 19th century and the French mathematical system methods according to the British were like the French themselves they were flowery they were superficial and they were ostentatious according to the British and the Encyclopedia Britannica was also very scathing about botany so a man would not naturally expect to meet with disgusting strokes of obscenity in a system of botany, but obscenity is the very basis of the Linnaean system. So in case you hadn't noticed the obscenity in the Linnaean system before, I'll explain it to you. So this is uh, one of Linnaeus's ways of, he wanted to quantify and rationalize the way that you classify plants. And he developed, his basic system was he set up 24 classes for male stamens and they were subdivided by the number of female pistils that a, a flower has got. So of course that's quite natural for, Lin, for Linnaeus coming from Enlightenment society that the male uh, sexual characteristics should be the major criterion of classification and the female ones were the secondary. Uh, everyone was absolutely happy with that, uh, whereas I th suspect women might not be now. Uh, but the reason, there were several reasons why this was a, a, initially a very, very controversial method of classification. One was that it imposed mathematical order onto God's creation and that was seen as being rather sacrilegious. So there were debates about whether you, can, whether you can quantify God's world. In England, although not, not in France or on the continent, there was a lot of hostility because, because this was a sexual classification. And botany was a science that women were encouraged to practice, but Linnaean botany was seen as being very dangerous because it was encouraging women to think about sex. And botany, like other sciences, also had political implications. This is Joseph Banks, president of the Royal Society, who sailed with Cook to Australia uh, as a botanist. That's why Botany Bay is named after Banks. And you can see um, he's, got, he's got wings uh, with shells on and the, um, in his left wing near his shoulder the shell has been replaced by a Phrygian cap of liberty and he's wearing the red, white and blue of the French revolutionaries. So as another example of a political caricature, that here in the centre there's a yellow cornucopia in the shape of the red cap of liberty. And it's called the cornupo whoops, cornucopia of ignorance. And it's got those four red-capped citizens holding it up. And it's a political horn of plenty and it's disgorging books and newspapers that were written by so-called Jacobins. I said it was a term of abuse. People like William Godwin, Mary Wollstonecraft, Coleridge's poetry. And immediately behind the cornucopia there's a street vendor with a basket on his head. And it's, he's got plants growing out of the basket. And the flower basket is labelled zoonomia or Jacobin plants. And these aren't any ordinary plants. They've blossomed into the bonnet rouge and the tricolour uh, cockades of the French revolutionaries. And zoonomia was the title of a two-volume book that Erasmus Darwin had written on medicine and which contained, towards the end, some very radical suggestions about life, evolution and the creation of life. And this is actually the central portion of a much larger um, cartoon, and it's by Gilray, and it was for the last volume of the Anti-Jacobin. So it, it appears in the same publication as The Loves of the Triangles. And there's a few familiar features, uh, like a, the, you, there's a sort of crocodile -y sort of thing at the front wearing stays, and that represents Tom Paine because he was originally a corset maker um, and he came from Norfolk and he was one of the staunchest supporters in England of the French Revolution. And there's also two frogs, which I can't see from the angle that I'm standing at, but there's two frogs, that, oh, there's two yellow frogs, that's right. And by this stage, frogs initially represented Dutchmen, but by this stage, frogs symbolised Frenchmen, and they're holding up this sheet of paper, and it's headed blank verse, and I assume that that's a reference to Darwin's uh, poetry. And there's all these other, the, every, every character in this caricature can be identified and you can see three other politicians waving their red caps of liberty on top of that rather um, grotesque monster. <laughs> 
So those are some examples of how quantification had political implications, and I'm going to show you a rather different version. This is by a Dutch naturalist called Peter Camper, who was very influential in Britain. His book came out in English at the end of the 18th century. And he was an anti-slavery campaigner, and what he claimed that he set out to do was to use measurement to show how small the differences are between people of different races. And these diagrams illustrate that he, he basically he measured this sort of facial angle, the angle at which your nose and your forehead slope back, and he performed some geometrical transformations. And he managed to display skulls on a continuous scale, ranging from orangutans at the top left, ranging through over to black Africans and then at the bottom you have to imagine this in one long continuous strip and he ends up on the right with uh, the epitome of beauty uh, which is the Greek Apollo, divine perfection if you're a, a white European at the end of the 18th century and whatever his intentions have, might have been these quantified uh, measured diagrams of, of skulls ended up uh, supporting a lot of the racial discrimination that was prevalent throughout the 19th century. So my initial question was why did the three anti-Jacobin satirists bother to write the loves of the triangles? And so far I've outlined some of the reasons why maths, measurement and botany had political implications and I think that goes some way towards answering my question. But I'm now going to change tack and talk about progress because, whoops, Sorry, I went too fast. Progress, because the satirists presented the loves of the triangles as a sequel to this poem, uh, The Progress of Man. The printing on the right is just because I thought you might not be able to read that. So it's The Progress of Man, a didactic poem de dedicated to R.P. Knight Esquire. Uh, this is Richard Payne Knight. Um, he's best known now as a landscape designer, but he'd also written a long rhyming poem, sort of rather, to my ears, rather like Darwin's, rather tedious, called The Progress of Civil Society, uh, which expressed evolutionary um, views. He'd also scandalized everyone. He was a very extremely knowledgeable antiquarian, and he'd published a book, uh, and I'm not going to show you pictures from this, unfortunately, about religious cults of phallic worship. And this book was very scandalous, so he was rather an ostracized man, although he did also become very famous for being a landscape designer. And I think we're so used now to evaluating everything in terms of progress. Um, there's that awful phrase, we're going to progress the company forwards. Progress is always positive. And I think it's difficult to remember that it wasn't always seen in that way. So I'm going to just do this sort of brief race through in Renaissance Europe, where there are two, basically two ways of thinking about time. One of them you could symbolize by Unorobarus, a serpent biting its own tail. Uh, it's, it recalls the Greek attitude towards time, but there's a cyclical universe that keeps recurring, rather like the annual seasons, although on a grand cosmic scale. So that's one tradition coming into 18th century Britain. And, and the other one is the more familiar, perhaps, the Judeo-Christian belief that God formed the world in a specific moment of creation. So in this version of time, time flies like an arrow shooting out from its origin in one direction. And it ties in very closely with modern cosmology, the idea of the Big Bang uh, fits very well with this model, but there is a crucial difference. Uh, the Bible states that the universe was originally created as it is now, whereas Big Bang theorists believe that the universe has been developing ever since its beginning. And I think this faith in progress, has in, both in the, universe, in the universe and in society, has become so ingrained that we forget that in the 18th century, it was still quite controversial. It was often called the luxury debate. A lot of people were very opposed to the idea of progress. And this very famous picture by Joseph Wright of Derby, uh, an experiment on a bird in the air pump, for me encapsulates some of these tensions. You can see the, the lecture dressed in red, and he's got an evacuated globe, and there's, there's a, a bird, a co white cockatoo inside it, which might represent the holy dove, the holy spirit. And he's got his hand on the stopcock, and he can choose either to let the air in, and the bird will live, or he can keep the stopcock closed, and the bird will die. And you can see there's a mixed reactions of the people uh, round 
the experiment. I mean, there's this couple over here who've been identified and they just got engaged and they really couldn't care about anything except each other. They're not interested in any of this at all. But you can see the mixed reaction of those two little girls, two sisters, one of whom's fascinated and the other who's looking away in absolute horror. And it sort of encapsulates for me some of the questions that were people were asking in this period. Did technological advance necessarily bring moral improvement? They worried perhaps that perhaps with too much convenience and luxury, people would lapse into decadence and moral decay. And in the wake of the French Revolution, the anti-Jacobin propagandists were challenging the value and meaning of progress. They were threatened by a very unstable political situation. And so they sought safety in maintaining the status quo rather than venturing into a future which was uncertain and which also might possibly be a Frenchified future. Now Erasmus Darwin was definitely on the side of progress and he praised the technological inventions of his friends in his poetry. So cotton spinning, for example, represented progress. With quickened pace, successive rollers move and these retain and those extend the rove. Then fly the spools, the rapid axles glow and slowly circumvolves the labouring wheel below. Now, the anti-Jacobin's version of these lines stressed traditional ways of life, cooking the roast beef, very traditional English um, meal. And they also were mocking his clunky poetry. He says, the spiral grooves in smooth meanders flow, drags a long chain, the polished axles glow, while cir slowly circumvolves, I'm, I can't imagine anyone else ever writing, except Darwin ever writing circumvolve, the piece of beef below, the conscious fire with bickering radiance burns, lies the rich joint and roasts it as its turn. However, from the anti-Jacobin point of view, Darwin's views on technological progress weren't nearly as bad as his ideas about social and physical progress. So I meant, earlier I mentioned that he'd written a two-volume textbook on uh, medicine called Zoonomia, and most of it was very, very highly regarded. But near the end, he included some very controversial ideas. For example, all nature exists in a state of perpetual improvement, i.e. nature is itself progressing and changing. It's not fixed, it's not static. And this is the extract that aroused the most defence and that was most often reproduced as being very sacrilegious. So, in the great length of time since the earth began to exist, perhaps millions of ages before the commencement of the history of mankind, that is already quite an extraordinary thing to be saying at the end of the 18th century, was that the earth existed for eons before mankind appeared. Would it be too bold to imagine that all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament? That also, that phrase, one living filament, ran him into a lot of trouble which the great first cause, God, endued with animality, um, with the power of acquiring new parts, attended with new propensities, and thus possessing the faculty of continuing to improve by its own inherent activity. So this was materialism, the, the idea that matter could improve itself absolutely sacrilegious at this period, and of delivering down those improvements by generation to its posterity world without end. So it's a very clear statement of an evolutionary principle. And the anti-Jacobin wrote an extremely long footnote about this quotation, and I'm not going to show you the whole lot, but I will show you two sections. The first one's the mathematical version. We may conceive this primeval point evolving itself by its own energies to have moved forward in a right line ad infinite until it grew tired, after which the right line which it had generated would begin to put itself in motion in a lateral direction describing an area of infinite extent capable of containing the present existing universe, which I think probably makes about as much sense as Darwin's original statement, but they obviously had a lot of fun writing that. Um, there's also, they went completely to town after a few lines later. Um, it seems highly probable that the first effort of nature terminated in the production of vegetables and that these supplied themselves with wings or feet. In time would restrict themselves to the use of their hind feet. Their tails would gradually rub off by sitting in their caves or huts. So there you have evolution being satirized. <laughs> 
But I think the reason, one of the reasons why this worked so well as a satire was that it wasn't directed exclusively at Darwin. Darwin wasn't the only person talking about evolution, talking about radical ideals. They set Darwin up as a target. So other people were talking about progress as well. So, for example, Joseph Priestley, the fam very famous chemist, discovered the gas now known as oxygen. And Priestley wrote, It is nothing but a superior knowledge of the laws of nature that gives Europeans the advantages they have over the Hottentots. Science advancing as it does, it may be taken for granted that mankind some centuries hence will be as much superior to us as we are now to the Hottentots. So there's this idea that uh, knowledge is improving, that British society is improving, but also that the whole of mankind is improving and progressing as well. And this idea of racial progress, which Priestley is articulating, was closely associated with the ideals of political and social progress expressed by the French revolutionaries. And I think this caricature expresses it quite well. It's a view sort of effectively from the North Pole. So America is over there and France is here. And you can see this is a, a Jacobin revolutionary. And on this side you've got the devil who is also black. So it's linking slavery with the American and the French revolutions. And its immediate inspiration was a slave rebellion in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, or on what's now known as Haiti. And this was a Caribbean uprising. It had been di directly prompted by the one in, France, in Paris. And for wealthy British people, the implications seem very clear, that the spirit of insurrection might not only cross the channel, but might also infect workers on plantations near uh, Saint-Domingue that were owned by the British people's own friends and relatives who might be massacred like their French counterparts had been and lose everything. So this link between the French and the American revolutions was a very close, they seem very different to us, but they was, the French, the American revolutions and slavery, those three questions were very closely bound together at the end of the 18th century, which is why I'm now going to talk about slavery. And the most obvious triangular relationship in this period was the triangular slave trade across the Atlantic. So it start, if you start at the top of the black arrow, you start in Europe or in Britain. Uh, coming from Britain, textiles were exported to Africa, where they were exchanged for gold that had been mined by black Africans. And then the gold and slaves were sent across to the plantations in America, in North and South America. They mined silver, produced sugar and tobacco and other crops, um, which were exported to Europe. Uh, made the slave owners extremely wealthy. So it's a sort of global triangular slaves trade with slaves effectively acting as a form of currency. And in Africa, the rate of exchange was roughly one slave is one gun. Sorry? Okay. Um, Well, I'll, I'll continue. In Britain, the, abolition, the movements to abolish slavery started in the 1770s, and they focused on what was called the Middle Passage, which is basically that red arrow, when slaves were transported from their African homes to the American plantations. And I'm going, so this is a piece of abolition propaganda, and it's a diagram of a very, very closely packed ship. And it shows you how they're a masterpiece of geometrical planning. So the allowance per slave was 5 foot by 11 inches by 23 inches in height. So officially, this particular ship could have 482 slaves crammed in lying down, although it sometimes carried over 600. And there was one absolutely horrendous occasion, called, a ship called the Zong, where the captain threw a hundred 133 slaves overboard for insurance policies uh, but they were reported only as numbers and in terms of their monetary values not as individual names which remain unknown and this is very very characteristic of the slave trade so this is this is what the inside of one of those ships looked like and you can see that each rack where a slave would lie has just got a number on it. That's how the slaves were um, identified. They were like sort of numerical quantities being shipped across the Atlantic. And these are quotations uh, from the diary of a slave trader uh, when he was anchored just off the African coast and they picked up some slaves. This day buried a fine woman slave, number 11. 
having been ailing some time. Sent a girl, ill of the flux, uh, 90, number 92, I'm sure. This morning buried a woman slave, number 47. So this is how slaves were thought of in terms of their numbers, their monetary value, how they could be set off against insurance rather than by their names. So the triangular slave trade hinged on sugar and consumption absolutely rocketed in Britain. Uh, by, the end, by 1790, uh, they were exporting four kilograms of sugar per year per person, which was more than the rest of Europe combined. And the poet Robert Southey called tea the blood-sweetened beverage, by which he meant um, it, the sugar was literally stained with the blood of slaves because the, the leaves of the sugar cane are very sharp and so slaves' arms were literally being cut and they were dripping blood into the sugar. But also metaphorically, it's, um, the, the tea was sweetened by sugar, which involved uh, slaves dying. In the West Indies, you could buy a slave for two-thirds of a tonne of sugar. So from the plantation owner's point of view, it made economic sense to work the slaves to death in a few years and then just simply buy another one. Um, rather like the modern fade, fair trade movement, it became very fashionable to support the slaves in the West Indies by boycotting sugar. And I'll show you another caricature. This is um, George III with his wife Charlotte. And you can see the, the daughters over there looking terribly dismayed because they're not, they're not getting any sugar in, in their tea. And uh, King George is saying, oh, delicious, delicious. And the Queen is telling them how good tea tastes without sugar. And you see she's got all her teeth all sort of filed into points. And she's, she's very bony. Uh, so it's implying that they're acting out of miserliness rather than out of fine feelings. That's why they're economising on on sugar and, and the ab um, boycotting the sugar movement was run to a large extent uh, by just ordinary families. A lot of women were very involved in it. During the 18th century, there were probably around 10,000 blacks living in England, and they were very often giving, given classical names. It was very patronising, condescending things to do, like Pompey or Socrates. And I found this little statuette of Aesop in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. And I think we think of slavery as being an American phenomenon, but it flourished in Britain with very little opposition for well over a century. And it was legal in Britain right up to the 1770s. So Darwin came from Lichfield um, near, near, Derbyshire in the, uh, near Derby in the Midlands. And on the right, in the middle, you can see the advertisement from 1772 of an advertisement for a slave auction in his hometown of Lichfield. So people like Darwin must have been aware that this trade in slaves was going on in Britain itself up to the 1770s. And in his poem the Botanic Garden, Darwin reproduced the, um, a picture of the very famous medallion by his friend Josiah Wedgwood with the slogan, Am I Not a Man and a Brother? Uh, it became the first sort of political logo, the, um, the picture and the, and the first political slogan, really. And Darwin wrote some lines to go with it. The slave in chains on supplicating knee spreads his wide arms and lifts his eyes to thee with hunger pale, with wounds and toil oppressed. Are we not brethren? Sorrow chokes the rest. And Darwin's description, this description here, appears in the mid middle of a long poetic tirade about political oppression in Europe. It was a cartoon I showed you before. Darwin's slave is asking, are we not brethren? But for Darwin and for his Enlightenment readers, brotherhood did not imply equality. I think the right to vote now seems one of the most fundamental in a democracy. Yet all sorts of restrictions were in place. You had to be over 21, you had to own property, and you had to be a man. So brotherhood definitely excluded sisterhood. And the most famous slogan promoting Enlightenment Brotherhood originated in the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Another example of how slavery in the French and the American revolutions at the time were linked together because political equality and racial equality were very, very closely allied. I won't summarize um, 
all of Darwin, I, mean, I won't tell you all of Darwin's uh, verses on this theme because it goes over pages, but I'll summarise it. So in effect, Darwin was expressing the same associations in this, as in this caricature, linking slavery with the French and the American revolutions. So he personified liberty as a warrior whose first stop had been America. And he wrote that once Benjamin Franklin had slain the vampires of tyranny, Liberty, the warrior, set sail for Europe and France, which he released from its restraining bonds of the Catholic Church and the monarchy. And in the same section as his description of Wedgwood's medallion, Darwin used a uh, biblical metaphor to visualise the sleeping giant of France triumphantly towering over the ruins of the Bastille. High o'er his foes, his hundred arms he rears, plowshares his sword and pruning hooks his spears. That's a biblical bit. Calls to the good and brave with voice that rolls like heaven's own thunder around the echoing poles. And the anti-Jacobin directly in the Loves of the Triangles parodied this bit. Or the huge plain gigantic terror stalks, the commune spreads the gay department's smile. Fair freedom's plant or shades the laughing isle. Fired with new hopes, the exulting peasant sees the Gallic streamer woo the British breeze. So we've got the plants and the, loves of the, the uh, satire of the loves of the plants in this mathematical poem. Uh, which is very much warning the British people about invasion uh, by Napoleon and the French Revolution coming over the Channel. So, those are some of the answers I've reached so far in my quest to understand the loves of the triangles. And I had absolutely no idea when I started doing this that I would end up thinking about slavery and the French Revolution. Uh, but that's one of the great delights of research and also the way of doing it, so I don't know if there are any politicians in this audience who are cost-cutting, but if they're listening, I would urge them to remember that you can't fund research on the basis of what you know in advance is going to come out of it. So please stop cutting research funding. But <laughs> that's, a, that's another issue. We are, the anti-Jacobin satirist wrote, more satisfied with things as they are than Darwin, but less convinced of the practical influence of didactic poems. I think academics are often rather annoying people because as soon as they see a statement, their first instinct is to think that they, how they can, can they contradict it. So I'm going to suggest why I think this is wrong, and I'm going to suggest that their, their own didactic poem did have a very great influence. To start with, it had an immediate impact on Darwin, and it encouraged him to rework the draft, man whoops, sorry, draft manuscript of his next major book. At this stage, it was initially it was called The Progress of Society. And then the loves of the triangles came out linking Darwin with, uh, with Payne Knight and this phallic cult and the progress of man. Darwin hated being associated with Knight. A lot of adverse publicity was generated. So to distance himself, he retitled and rewrote his book and he called it The Temple of Nature or The Origin of Society. And it eventually appeared in 1803, which was half a century before another book, on evolution, as the temple of nature, on evolution with a very similar title, On the Origin of Species, and the title of Charles Darwin's book. So, of course, I can't predict or retrodict what would have happened if the loves of the triangles hadn't appeared, but as I pointed out at the beginning of this lecture, its influence did extend right through the 19th century and into the 20th. And I'm also not going to speculate, unlike many people, about the influence of Erasmus Darwin on his grandson. But I am going to leave you with a puzzle, a question. Which Darwin, Erasmus or Charles, wrote these lines? Such is the condition of organic nature, whose first law might be expressed in the words, eat or be eaten, and which would seem to be one great slaughterhouse, one universal scene of rapacity and injustice. So thank you very much for listening. That's the end of my talk.